Greetings all! You will recall a couple of months ago I read through the reports of US testing of what is arguably the worst tank ever made. Not necessarily because it was mechanically the worst, though it was of course utterly awful, uh, but because not only was it utterly awful, it also entered into serial production with the intent of being deployed in active service in that condition. I speak of course of the Marmon Harrington produced MTLS 1G14 and its close relative, the CTMS 1TB1. If you somehow missed this, I would direct you to look back at that video entitled The Worst Tank You Never Heard Of. I've put the link in the description down below if you want to bring yourself up to speed before we progress onwards. For this video, we're going to walk back just a little bit further in time. Before the silliness of the tanks, which I have related previously, Marmin Harrington had established quite a reasonable reputation as a manufacturer of civilian vehicles. Working on this, it created a series of light tanks, really tankettes, which were good enough to be accepted for line service with the US Marine Corps. I have not been able to find the record of the US Marine testing, but I have come across a document from Aberdeen Proving Grounds. They wanted to do a series of tests relating to the various designs of track, and the CTL-3, known in the test report as the Marine Corps Light Combat Tank, had a band track suspension system which was suitable for testing different widths, tread types, and whatnot. In particular, the Marine vehicles came with tracks with replaceable rubber blocks. In July 1939, Ordnance Department made arrangements with the US Marine Corps for a tank to be transferred to Aberdeen for testing. The Commandant sent an instruction to the commander of 1st Marine Brigade, Fleet Marine Force Marine Barracks Quantico, Virginia, to transfer a tank from 1st Tank Company, together with an officer and two men, in August. A Captain Charles G. Mintz and Sergeants John E. McMillan and John H. Wilson were instructed to drive the vehicle to Aberdeen by road. A Lieutenant Collins and Privates Phillips, Smith and Crosby were to take a G-car to escort them and generally help out once they got to Aberdeen. They arrived the evening of the 14th of August after a road trip of approximately 120 miles for some day of 10 days of testing. There was precedent for this. In April of that year, the Army had sent an M2A2 light and an M1 combat car down to Quantico by road march for the Marines to play with, and they had arrived without incident. Before digging into the test report, however, a quick look at what Marmon Harrington, Registration Number 34 of the Neutrality Act, has to say about the CTL series in its sales brochure. The CTL 1, 2, and 3 tanks are light, two-man tanks capable of being instantly pivot-turned, and for this reason, the weight of the turret has been eliminated. Reminder for modern tankers, pivot turned means locking one track completely and pivoting around it, as distinguished from neutral steering. The common terminology in the US changed in the 1980s, for those who are wondering. Anyway, the vehicles normally came with a 12-cylinder gasoline engine, 4.3 liters cranky at 110 horsepower, 186 foot-pounds, and mated to a four-speed transmission though a 6-cylinder, 5.2-liter, 95-horsepower petrol made it to a 5-speed, which pulled out 224 foot-pounds, or a 6-cylinder, 4.7-liter, 85-horsepower, 188 foot-pounds diesel engine, also at a 5-speed, were also on offer. For whatever reason, the vehicle tested in 1939 by Aberdeen was equipped with a Ford V8, of 85 horsepower. As near as I can gather, the first CTL-3s were delivered with the Lincoln V-12s, the second batch came with the Hercules six cylinders, and some of the V-12s were later upgraded to the Ford V-8. Anyway, the promo sheet continues. Marmon Harrington Controlled Differential Drive. Steering control is by means of a special Marmon Harrington steering clutch unit, individual control for each track service brakes, and parking brakes. Two 22-gallon fuel tanks with explosion and fireproof filler caps. A specially designed Marmon Harrington cooling system is provided, which is capable of taking care of the engine under all conditions. As an aside, note the distinction between a control differential drive and a control differential steering system. 
The vehicle had the first, but not the second. Now, I'm not sure what mechanically the difference is, but suffice to say there is one, as became evident in reading the test report. The tracks are described as Marmon Harrington 10-inch wide 70-pitch cable type rubber belt track with front drive. Fish scale type guides, idler assemblies are of special Marmon Harrington design with closely controlled easy riding spring action. A steady firing platform is provided and the leaping action usual in other tanks is eliminated. All armor used on Marmon Harrington combat tanks is made up to very rigid specifications, and this armor has been used by the Marmon Harrington Company in supplying combat units to the US Army, and it has invariably been sufficiently good to earn a bonus payment under provision of the US Army specification requirements. Okay, in fairness, armor quality was not something discussed in the Aberdeen reports that I'd gone over for the MTLS or CTMS. So let's assume at least that Marmon Harrington know how to make very good quality steel. The major difference between the CTLs 1, 2, and 3 is in the thickness of the armor, though the earlier vehicles have more slope and less internal volume to make up for it. The marine vehicles were CTL 3s with more vertical fronts and a half inch of armor on the front and the sides. Now the fun bit, the guns. The standard equipment on this tank is a single gun mount in front of the gunner, capable of providing a 30 caliber 7.9mm or equal gun. Optional at extra charge, a duplicate mount can be placed in front of the chauffeur, yes it does say chauffeur, or an additional gun in the center of the nose between the chauffeur and the gunner, each mount capable of carrying the above or equivalent caliber. Marmon Harrington Company will provide gun mounts suitable to mount the standard machine gun used in any army. Ammunition racks will be provided to suit purchaser's requirement and to suit the caliber of ammunition used in the purchaser's gun. Now, if you go to the fine print, it has the following to say. The machine gun mount is a special Marmon Harrington ball mount which has been worked out to take the standard Colt Browning tank type machine gun. It can also be changed over to take any other standard air-cooled gun suitable for use in tank service. Which does actually bring up the comment on the MTLS test report that the Colt machine guns were not compatible with the Browning machine guns that the US Army used. So I guess if the Army really wanted to, they could have thus asked for, and probably had to pay, that the ball mounts be reconfigured from the Colt to the Browning. Given the Colt Browning and Browning were generally similar, it probably wouldn't have cost too much. But anyway, back to the fine print. When the purchaser desires to have his own machine gun or other guns fitted to these mounts, it is requested that a sample of each one of the guns to be so fitted with suitable quantity of ammunition be forwarded to the Marmon Harrington factory in the United States in order that the gun may be properly installed and suitable firing tests be conducted to determine the proper balance of the gun and the mount. Now, something not specified in the brochure is the caliber 50, which could be mounted in the front center of the various vehicles. If you wanted the third gun mounted, you would likely also have a third visor installed over top of it, presumably to help you aim. This gun, with the same 20 degrees of traverse to each side as the main guns, was presumably shared, or else the gunner would just have to like, shift over a bit to shoot it using the central visor. There are sadly no photos I could find of the seating arrangements. However, photos do exist of the gunnery arrangements on both the CTL-1, which shows clearly how the chauffeur's machine gun is on top of the driving controls, and on the CTL-3, shown here with all guns at maximum left traverse. And all this for a combat weight of about five and a half tons. Again, this met marine requirements, which if you will recall my discussion with Ken Estes over on the World of Tanks channel, primarily revolved around weight. So, back to Aberdeen. The morning of the 15th of August, the group of testers met up with the Marines, who had arrived the evening before, and set about the vehicle. The first thing that they realized was that the vehicle in question was basically the TA-30 tractor, which they had tested about two years previously, except with an armored body, 
the addition of a transfer case for high-low ranges making eight forward and two reverse gears, and an air-boosted hydraulic steering system instead of air brakes. This wasn't apparently a great start as they didn't have great memories of the TA-30. The second thing that they discovered was that on the road march up, the vehicle, which had at that point some 1,649 miles on the clock, did not have an uneventful trip up. En route, the vehicle tended to drift to the right, and then the left brake failed three times, in one case resulting in the tank running off the road to the right and then rolled over onto its side. Fortunately, it was light enough that these six men could right it, and it could then continue on its way. The brake failures were dealt with by bleeding the brake lines, or also by simply allowing the brakes to cool. The folks at Aberdeen felt that the high temperatures inherent in the hydraulic air power steering system used may have vaporized some of the brake fluid and formed bubbles in the lines. Before starting the tests on the running gear, and presumably looking to also avoid the practical application of rollover drills, the ordnancemen decided to try to correct the drift to the right. Well, it turned out when they discovered that the roller bearings on the right idler were rough, and the lubricant was also excessively heavy. They telegrammed Quantico to have a replacement set of bearings flown in by air the following morning. They also repaired the wire that was going to the siren. After photographing and measuring the vehicle, they called it quits and awaited the following day and the replacement parts. Now, allow me to read some of the daily entries. August 16th. Air compressor belt failed. One track guide lug failed. Outer ring of drive sprocket failed and had to be welded. The drive sprockets are too light for this vehicle as they bend easily and are already welded at several points from previous failures. Took resistance to traction records. Tank still creeps to the right and requires frequent left brake to stay on the road. However, when the tank was towed by dynamometer with no power to the tank sprockets, the vehicle towed without a tendency to creep to the right. The new wheel bearings were delivered by plane from Quantico this date and were installed prior to any testing. Right idler turned freely with the new bearings and standard wheel bearing grease, which was lighter than that used by the Marine Corps, Brake drums heat rapidly to a high temperature after very nominal use. Radiator boiled furiously after very limited operation. Not a great start. August 17th. Operated 16 miles to this date. Took resistance to traction and maximum speed with the fifth wheel. The maximum speed obtained on level concrete and high gear was 30 miles an hour, which actually matches the sales pitch. Radiator was flushed out prior to operation, but water boiled frequently during test. Uh, installed a thermocouple fitting to the left brake. Uh, heat transfer from metal, the following results were obtained. Running to the left, approximately 100 foot diameter circles at approximately six miles an hour using the left brake only. And it just has a list after, so at 132 they started, they got 20 laps. After 15 minutes, brake temperature went from 118 to 330. So they let it cool for, for a couple of minutes, two minutes. And then away, away they went again for another 21 minutes for another 20 laps, I guess. Left brake completely out. That's at 498 degrees. Engine shut off. Uh, a mercury thermometer suspended in the crew compartment above the differential registered 112 degrees during operation and 114 while the brakes were cooling. Outside air temperature, 91. It was necessary to bleed the left brake and add more fluid before any brake action could be obtained. Uh, then there were more readings of the thermocouple. Yeah, nothing else interesting here. August 18th. Removed right and left brake drums. Outer rubber cover caps of hydraulic brake cylinder on left brake pad had melted away. Inner pressure sealing cups were in a bad shape. Rubber burned off edges, some cracks and life gone out of rubber. Took photographs. Brake linings are entirely metal and appear to be copper. There are numerous slots out across faces of linings similar to commutator on an electric motor. Installed new rubber units, pistons and spring on left brake. 
metal brake linings showed evidence of embrittlement and flaking of metal. And then I'm going to skip over a few more bits. Center of gravity was obtained. Uh, maximum theoretical slopes of operation, 53 backwards, 54 operated in sunken road for three crossings and steering failed through loss of air. Air valve failed to function. It was noted at that time that the floor of engine compartment was covered with oil and engine oil sump was very nearly empty. Both springs and air valve rusted, one so badly that it broke allowing air to escape. Oil probably leaked out around crankshaft, pulley and clutch while tank was tilted during determination of center of gravity. Made up new springs for air valve and continued operation in sunken road. Threw left track twice operating on side slopes. Track did not come off entirely and was put in place both times by backing tank up a slope. The tracks seem very sensitive as regards staying in place on side slopes. The grouser effect of the rubber track blocks rapidly packed with moist earth and their effect was lost. Tank could not negotiate either the 25 or 35 degree slope from its standing start principally because of a lack of traction and not power. Um, at no time was the lack of power or low gearing observed. Uh, with the exception of the tendency to throw the down slope track, operation on side slopes was satisfactory. That, that's a pretty big exception. Uh, the lack of traction is common to all rubber tracks without grousers, either band or block. A loose connection to the oil filter was found, which probably accounts for the amount of oil previously found on the floor of the engine compartment. Uh, a few more slope tests. The brake held on all slopes, including 60%. On a 60%, a pencil could be put in between the track and the roadway directly under the front bogey wheel, so it's obviously tilting back a long way. No lack of power or gearing was evident. Um, tank was operated in the sand course. Flotation appeared to be excellent. No lack of power or adequate gearing was evident. Pivot turns could be made using first gear high range. The right track worked off the idler in making a pivot turn and wedged on the inner circle of the skeleton idler with the guide lugs straddling the circle. Both idler and drive sprocket are of skeleton construction and are too light to properly perform their function. Both idler and drive sprocket have holes or slots in the surface next to the track. This proof officer drove tank for a short time cross country and rode over the dirt hump courses. In general, the vehicle gives a very rough ride. The ride over the dirt humps at slow speed is very severe. It was noted that the propeller shaft is not enclosed at the point of entry into the differential. There is a possibility that a member of the crew might get his trousers entangled in the rotating shaft and be injured. It was noted that the difficulty shifting gears was considerable. A synchro mesh transmission would greatly improve the action of the vehicle as it is necessary to bring the vehicle almost to a stop to change gears. The vehicle negotiated both the shallow and deep mud courses with ease in second high. Flotation appeared to be excellent. At times the water level was over the uppermost point of the tracks, completely hiding them. A brake adjustment door in the hull of the tank was left open by mistake and considerable water was taken into the tank. The fan threw a spray of water out the rear louvers, but the engine did not stall. After pulling out of the mud course, the tank was run up a short bank and the drain plug in the engine compartment removed. Several gallons of water were removed. After pulling out of the mud course and draining out the water from the engine compartment, the tank was driven 150 yards down the cross-country course when the tank failed to steer. Power was delivered to both tracks, but application of the steering brakes gave no effect other than heating the brakes. It was understood from the Marine Corps drivers that the spider gears in the differential frequently failed, and that this was the second differential to fail in this particular tank during a period of about three weeks. About 155 miles had been obtained from this differential to date. The tank was towed to the shop. That was August 21st, by the way. August 22nd. Disassembled differential and found two spider gears had failed and another had frozen to its shaft. Apparently the failure was caused by the spiders freezing to their shafts as two of the shafts were marred with metal picked out by the spider gears. It is felt that a standard truck differential, such as this unit, 
is not designed to resist the continuous loading that it receives in steering this vehicle. The Marine Corps personnel with the tank were apparently thoroughly familiar with the weaknesses of the vehicle as a new spider gear assembly was amongst the spare parts brought from Quantico. In fact, spare parts for practically every failure which occurred rubber seals and hydraulic brake cylinders, track guide lugs, spider gear assembly, brake fluid, etc., were brought from Quantico with an anticipation of need which bespoke thorough familiarity with the vagaries of the vehicle. Uh, for purposes of the traction, okay, so going to the track uh, differential, uh, track differences. Remember, this vehicle was brought up to test different types of track. So August 22nd, 23rd to start doing this. Um, August 23rd, uh, new tracks, 10-inch tracks, arrived from Quantico by plane. In as much as a set of 8-inch tracks were available, it was decided to take their resistance in addition. However, just as the vehicle was leaving the shop, the steering failed. The air valve was found to be leaking due to the fact that the springs previously made up were too weak. Okay, not necessarily Marmon Harrington's fault there. Stiffer springs were made up and installed. Uh, you have to give it to these guys in Aberdeen. They're sure determined to test. You know, they're given a vehicle to test. They will do whatever it takes to get it tested. Um, it, uh, it operated six miles, taking resistance. Um, it was felt that the records obtained with the fifth wheel might be a limited worth as the tank still pulled to the right and required occasional left brake to stay on the road. Uh, August 24th. Due to, the stanger, uh, due to the danger of steering failure on the highway, the tank was loaded into the body of a 7.5 ton truck for the return trip to Quantico. Overall then, the report stated in the remarks section, ground pressure was excellent with a pressure of 7.3 pounds per square inch at zero inches of penetration. The ability of the tank to negotiate vertical obstacles was surprising. For slope climbing, it was felt a 60% slope was passable. There was no lack of power and the brakes held. The gearing is such that the vehicle could accompany marching troops, but it is doubtful if the cooling system would permit it. The cooling system is undoubtedly inadequate, as frequently during the test the water in the radiator boiled furiously. The suspension flexibility of the vehicle was very good over ordinary dirt roads. The smaller irregularities were absorbed by the suspension. However, deep holes and wheel ruts caused jolting to be transmitted to the driver and assistant. The latter may well be caused more by the short wheelbase than the suspension flexibility. The riding qualities of this vehicle are good only on reasonably level ground. Over rougher terrain, the riding qualities are very bad. Wheel ruts, mud holes, and other such irregularities cause severe jolting to the driver and assistant. Chauffeur, have they not read the manual from Marmon Harrington? The Marine Corps officers pointed out that the triangular plates carrying the bogey wheels had buckled previously, and sections of slotted pipe had been welded over the edges as stiffeners. This buckling and changing in suspension probably accounts for the continual drift to the right. It is understood that the drifting is not confined to this individual tank, but is common to all tanks of this model used by the Marine Corps. The vehicle performed well in sand and mud. In running cross country, it was noticed that gears were hard to shift considering the type powertrain used. Synchro mesh transmission would greatly improve the cross country action of the vehicle. It is understood that failure by breakage of the rubber band tracks used on this tank has not been uncommon. Overall conclusions, and this is where you start new time stamp to if you're linking just for the bottom line overview. One, that hydraulic air power steering as used on this vehicle is not only undesirable and unreliable, but dangerous. Two, that the skeleton idler and dry sprockets construction is not rugged enough to be considered satisfactory. 3. Engine cooling is inadequate. 4. The riding qualities cross-country are poor. 5. That the power and gear range are adequate. 6. This is what's positive. 6. That the gears are difficult to shift. 7. That an unshielded portion of the propeller shaft may result in accident to the crew. 8. That the conventional truck differential used in the steering system is mechanically unreliable when employed for steering purposes. 
9. That the suspension is not rugged enough for tank use. 10. That, in general, the tank is unsatisfactory as a high-speed combat vehicle. 11 to 15 related purely to the experimental track type testing and are not really relevant here. Now, in fairness to Marmon Harrington, they explicitly told the Marines that they had to use truck components and could not drop a control differential steering system in because of the hard weight limit that the Marines had mandated. But still, that, you know, that is only part of the problem with the vehicle. So how did the Marines find the vehicles? If you hop over to Estes' book, Marines and Armor, we see that after the first exercise in landing these tanks, where the potential of the tanks was fully demonstrated, and they realized yeah, these tanks could be a good thing, the report stated that the tank was unreliable and underpowered. Two crewmen had difficulty with three machine guns, there was no turret, obviously, and if the Navy can lift a 21-ton boat off the ship into the sea, why are we limited to a 5-ton tank? Quoting Estes, from the Fleet Exercise 5 of January 1939 of the four tank platoon used. Operating only 100 miles per vehicle over 50 days, the CTL-3s experienced 107 failures requiring action by mechanics. Crews complained of structural weakness and a tendency to throw track at any time. Not that it stopped the Army and Marines from getting more Marmon Harringtons. Obviously, the situation was desperate. The Marines buying some CTL-6s and CTM-3 TBD turreted tanks, and of course the U.S. Army ended up using a bunch designated light tank T-16. If I ever come across the tests and evaluation reports for those, I'll let you know. Considering how many hundreds of tanks Marmon Harrington built in the lead-up to the U.S. involvement in World War II, one wonders just how desperate the buyers were. Anyway, that's it for today. Hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.